Good evening, everyone. Um, just before we begin, let's do some tests to make sure you can hear me. So I'd like you to use your dashboard um, to put up your hand uh, if you can hear me. Yep, that's right. Just practice putting the hand up because you can't, the computer won't break, believe me, it's all safe. There's nothing you can do this evening that'll uh, disconnect you unless you leave the webinar, of course. Um, so that's great, you can hear me. Great. And um, I want to make sure that there's no echo, so just pop in the um, questions if there's any echo. Can you hear me clearly? And we'll get going. No echo. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Alexander. Okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is David Linko. Welcome to the webinar this evening. Uh, tonight we're doing a topic, Wealth Planning in the Midst of Uncertainty, and it's very timely given what's happened since our last webinar. Uh, now, before we begin, an advice warning, um, not warning, just a, more of a disclaimer. I'll be going through quite a bit of material this evening. Um, so before you apply any of it, make sure you do get financial advice uh, because everyone's uh, personal circumstances are different. I'll just go to the webcam for a moment just to introduce myself and then go back to the uh, webinar. <clears throat> so hopefully um, that'll work. Okay, fantastic. So my name is David Linko. So I'm doing this webinar from my office in Thornley. Um, and uh, the webinar for those listening online was recorded on Wednesday, the 8th of April, 2020. Um, but the content is very much timeless. Um, the dates were applicable. I've actually stamped them on the relevant slides. Um, and if you enjoy the webinar, please comment or share it. I'll be uploading it to Facebook in the next 24 hours. So yeah, my name's David Link. I'm the principal of Davlin Wealth Management. Um, I, I suppose my background, uh, for those of you who are not aware, because 30% of the people attending this evening uh, came along because of a recommendation or through Facebook or LinkedIn. So for those of you welcome, my name is David Link. My background is as a qualified accountant. Uh, I'm a mortgage broker and also a qualified financial planner. And the reason I wear a number of different hats is to help you make good financial decisions, pretty simple. Um, I've got a team of six people at my office in Thornley, and uh, we've got three divisions uh, in the business. One is Davlin Accounting, one is Davlin Mortgages, and Davlin Financial Planning. Now, for those that uh, are here this evening, 60% um, of you, um, we're already working with. So very warm welcome to all of our Dalvin clients. Um, and so 30% 30, 30 um, have said that they're new to Dalvin and 10% didn't say. Uh, for those over 55, um, I've had some queries. So um, rather than waiting for you to call in the next couple of days, I'll be calling all of you. So all of my clients over 55, I'll be calling you in the next couple of days. And if, if you'd like to contact me sooner, just give us a call in the office and make a time and I'll speak with you via Zoom or um, go to meeting or on the telephone. Um, now a bit of age demographics for who is attending this evening, just to let you know who's out there in the audience. Um, for, sorry, I'm just reading a question. Um, no, just a little bit of the breakup of the audience this evening. 95% of you attending are property investors. Okay, or property owners, let's say. 73 people registered and there's a number who've come and still coming in. Um, a small portion are under 31, so well done to you if you're under 31. Uh, your financial literacy is going to be significantly ahead um, than those of us who started later, including myself. The bulk of you, uh, there's 40% between 31 and 55 and the largest category, 50% is over 56. Um, so I'll be tailoring it to you people. Um, in terms of anxiety, um, there's low to medium anxiety. 56% I'm reading um, registered medium level of anxiety in, in the current marketplace. Um, only 8% said high and about 37 said low. So medium is the um, main level of anxiety. And, and that's pleasing to me because it means for those of you who are my clients, uh, you've known the annual review meetings that we do and the phone calls um, and I've been talking to you about asset allocation, which I'll talk about this evening as well. Um, so we run webinars every six to eight weeks, and I'll let you know the next ones. But my role very simply is to help you make good financial decisions by improving your financial literacy. And that's why I run these webinars. So whether it's looking to build a property portfolio, grow your super, uh, protect your assets in a market crash like this, or approaching retirement, 
my role is to give you options, have a look at your financial position and let you know what your options are so you make good decisions. Um, and don't take my word for it, we do ask our clients to provide testimonials on our Facebook page, on our Google account, advisor ratings or LinkedIn, so find out what they have to say. But let's now get on with the webinar and I'll take you off the webcam um, and we'll get um, going. Um, this evening I've got a fairly tight time frame, so I will be moving through the content uh, a little bit quickly, but bear in mind that the webinar will be recorded and you'll be able to view it um, at your leisure via looking at the recording on, on Facebook, or if you're a client, certainly give me a buzz as well. So agenda, threefold agenda this evening, uh, government benefits for small business, which you should already know about a lot of it. And the last two, what I'd like to spend the most time on. Um, so lots of government stimuluses, not only at a federal level, but at a state level as well. Um, and so what I'd like to do is just focus on three key ones. Um, these are the big ticket items as far as uh, I'm, I'm concerned for a lot of our clients. And one is the cash flow boost. Um, the cash flow boost is a significant opportunity. Uh, it's, it's applicable for small to medium businesses, less than 50 million turnover though. Okay, and essentially it's uh, an opportunity to um, to withhold the tax benefits, 20K through to 100K, the cap was increase. Um, the job seeker payment, that's also a significant one, $1,500 per fortnight for eligible employers. What's an eligible employer? Well, it's where the turnover has reduced by more than 30% compared to last year. So even if you've been laid off, um, you can actually be put back on the books. Um, so that's essentially what the job seeker payment is for. It's, it's essentially keeping people uh, employed. Um, and early access to super, that's the one I've had a couple of queries about. Um, that one there is uh, if you're unemployed or um, this is after the 1st of January 20, or you've been made redundant, um, or your working has have been reduced from more than 20%, you're now eligible to access your super under very relaxed um, financial distress provisions. Um, and that can be done through the ATO. Uh, deferral of loan repayments are not there, but that's through the lenders um, websites. They've got areas and it's a deferral, not a, not a, not a, um, a forgiveness. Uh, it's a deferral where the interest is capitalized and then the loan term is renegotiated. So, so bear that in mind. I'll get to the questions at the end. Uh, so thank you for those that are popping them in. Um, and the subject to time, of course, as well. Now, the best person to go to is your accountant. Your accountant is your best friend. If you're a small business owner, you should have had a chat to your accountant. Uh, we've got two accountants from Dublin Accounting uh, who can assist you to do this if, if you don't have one. Okay, let's now move on to uh, life stage investing. So, we need to know, the, the, the topic I introduced this as initially was how to ride a market crash, but I think it's better uh, stated if we actually prepare for a market crash, because inevitably market corrections or crashes, whatever you want to call them, do occur. Um, I say prepare for one every 10 to 12 years. Um, and if you're not prepared, it's really a case of luck that you don't get trashed. Uh, I know in my ocean kayaking journey, um, that's the sport that I'm involved in, when I was learning, I didn't actually prepare for waves and that would have helped if I looked, but then had the technique and I got trashed quite often. And with regard to investing, it's really quite important to prepare for market crashes because they do occur. And if you're prepared, you can ride it more effectively. So let's go through uh, what I mean about these three phases. So we've got the accumulation phase, the holding phase and drawdown phase um, based on your life stages, then your earning capacity reduces over time as does your tolerance to the market volatility. Understandably, if you're in accumulation phase, you'll be under 55, say, under 50. Uh, you've got more time to ride at any volatility. Whereas if you're in the holding phase, um, you, you could be under 55 still. Um, the holding phase could be anywhere from when you've got all your assets to when you're looking to hold them until they increase in value prior to the drawdown phase. So these are not distinct age categories. They're, there's gray lines um, on either side of them. The holding phase, however, is where you're looking to hold the assets. You've utilized all your surplus cash flow to holding your property portfolio and contributing to the super. And there's no more surplus, so you're in a holding phase. 
Um, so generally, this is when we're a bit older um, because you, you've uh, utilised all of your um, surplus income, I suppose, and your income as of a maximum, so you've deployed it. Then we get to the blue area, which is your drawdown phase when we're in retirement. And because we've ceased working and our income earning capacity is low, um, our tolerance to market volatility is uh, consequently low as well. The other way to look at these is, uh, is the focus, whether we have an upside focus or a downside focus. It's really important to understand that during the accumulation and the holding phase, we're always looking for upside. It doesn't really matter that it goes down, not as much anyway, than if you're in drawdown phase when you can't afford to lose any capital because you're not working, you can't ride it out. So it's always important to look at these three life stages of investing and I'll refer to them um, I'll refer to them quite a bit this evening. So these life stages are in direct line with our earning capacity and our tolerance for risk. So it's always um, it's always important to focus on the correct um, uh, wealth stage, whether we're looking for upside or whether we're looking to manage the downside. Um, and in some cases, you can still have upside focus in the drawdown phase if you've got a large nest egg. So that's why it's important to get uh, relevant advice um, appropriate to your portfolio. I've got clients who are in the drawdown phase that um, have an upside focus. So it's, it's, this is in the main, but it's certainly not always the case. So what does this mean in the real world? Well, um, I think it's important. Most of us are very positive people. So without knowing it, we can automatically take our mindset of wealth creation into the drawdown phase. And a classic case of that is where we continue to hold um, property investments into the drawdown phase um, because they are a growth asset, they can give us downside. Um, and similarly for superannuation, if you haven't reviewed your superannuation asset allocation, um, often it's still in growth when we're in drawdown. So it's very important to review them um, as we get older. So let's now examine what that means a little bit more um, and look at the definition. What's, what's a growth asset and what's a defensive asset? And this is another key concept that I'll look at throughout the presentation. Now, growth asset are those assets that are more volatile and they generate a high return in the long run. So if you're investing for capital growth, that's a growth asset. And some asset types, um, shares um, can be considered a growth asset, property as well, but you can always find the exception as well. Okay, so in the main, shares are a growth asset. In the main, property is a growth asset. Uh, defensive asset, what's that? Well, they're assets that in the long term provide lower rates of return and the return they provide are primarily income. Okay, so they're not going to give you much capital growth. Um, they'll give you mainly income and it'll be a lower return, uh, but on the on the um, positive side of things, they're not as volatile either. So we know about life stage investing. I talked about in the earlier slide, we talked about accumulation holding a drawdown. Now let's talk about the proportion of growth assets to defensive assets in each of these life stages. Uh, and this is known as your asset allocation. Oh, sorry, one thing I forgot to mention, there are always hybrids. Hybrids are those assets which have a combination of defensive and growth, okay? But let's put them to one side. Let's focus on the main ones. So when you're in accumulation phase, uh, generally you've got a long time till retirement, typically anywhere from 10 to 15 years plus. So you'll have of in your portfolio, and if we're looking at super initially at this concept called asset allocation, you'll have anywhere 70 to 100% invested in shares. It's an expressed as a ratio, we refer to it as a 70, 30 or 100, zero asset allocation, okay? As you get older, um, and you and um, or maybe in, in the middle ages, middle middle stages of life, you may reduce your allocation to 50% in growth, or still keep it as high as 70. Okay, so you can see the exposure to more volatile assets is reducing, and then when we get to drawdown phase or approaching retirement, we can't take the volatility anymore. So what we do, we reduce our exposure to growth assets um, to zero in some cases but typically no more than 30. Now, once again, there are exceptions and the exceptions are where I've got a number of assets who have got um, a wealth position where they can afford to take a greater growth position than 30%. But in the main, 
30% uh, is the maximum. And as you can see, the reason is volatility. Uh, the higher exposure to growth assets, the higher the volatility. So in accumulation, you've got potentially up to 70% exposure in growth assets. It's going to be high volatility in the holding phase. And the holding phase, there's no specific age category. Someone said, is there an age guideline? There isn't, it depends how healthy you are, how long you're looking to continue working for, what your retirement goals are. Uh, so let's say in the holding phase, we reduce the volatility because you're approaching retirement. That could be anywhere five years, could be 10 years. And, and drawdown is when you're actually in retirement where the focus shifts on managing your downside. So you reduce the exposure to your shares. Um, so it, it's really quite important to manage volatility. So this will make sense in our next slide. We talk about two fictional clients, Fred and Wilma. So let me ask you, what is the asset allocation for Fred and Wilma this evening? Okay, so you can see they've got a um, investment property portfolio and I've got the net value here. Let's say 600, okay? So I've worked out what the um, proceeds are if they sold it. So that would be a growth asset or a defensive asset, the property portfolio. Well, per by definition previously, an asset which is going to give you capital growth, I've defined it as a growth asset. Okay, there are always exceptions. For, for this case, majority of my clients have um, as, property assets for capital growth. So in this case, they've got a net value of 600K. They've got superannuation in the 70-30 splits. So remember 70 or the numerator is always the growth portion and the denominator or 30 is the defensive portion. So that would be 280K, 70% of 400, 280 is a growth assets. And shares, well, that would be a growth asset. So the growth proportion in this case, in working out the asset allocation is 900,000. That would be the 600 plus the 280 plus the 20. 900 is in growth and 120 is in defensive. So our asset allocation for this client is 88.12, or I would refer to that to be in high growth. Okay, so that's how you work out your asset allocation. It's very key that you understand this, um, particularly as you got over the magic number of 50, uh, you need to know what your asset allocation is, particularly over 55 uh, when you're on the home stretch and you can see retirement around the corner. Okay, uh, so is everyone comfortable with how to work out asset allocation? And I think this would be a good exercise to um, have a look at this when you um, finish the webinar as well to find out what your asset allocation is and to ensure it's appropriate to your life stage as well. Um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, so let's look at asset allocation strategies over time. And this will address some of the questions uh, that I have been asked as well. So on the left-hand side, uh, we've got the asset allocation. On the bottom, it's zero, 100. So that means it's, it's um, zero exposure to growth assets and predominantly defensive. On the top left-hand corner, I've got 100, zero. So that means it's a growth, predominantly growth uh, um, geared portfolio where 100% towards growth assets. And then you've got the various life stages of accumulation, holding and drawdown. And as you can see, there's an overlap. So which one are you? Let's look at a couple of asset allocation strategies. So the first one might be person A. So you can see, um, at the left-hand side of the graph, they were up high, 100, zero. As they get into holding, they drop down. That's say when they're about 45, they went to get to 55, they, they get down and hold it at that level. That could be uh, an asset allocation strategy that you follow. You could be a person that when you approach 60, you follow asset allocation strategy B, where you dial it down a bit more. So your allocation towards growth assets is only 20% so. And everyone is different, by the way. So there's no right or wrong here. It depends on what other assets you have. Um, I talked to a client yesterday, or this, this afternoon actually from Canberra. Uh, they've got an asset allocation um, of 70, 30, sorry, 30, 70. Um, and, um, and, and they could actually have it as 50, 50. Uh, the reason is they've got investment properties that they haven't sold. So they've got additional funds in the bank um, should they run out of liquidity. Um, some people are line C where they're changing it um, a number of times. The problem with this strategy is, um, is that uh, 
it's, it's quite costly because every time you change, there are costs involved and, and it's extremely difficult trying to time it as well. Um, and some people are D where they actually don't know it, um, what their asset allocation is. So it's really quite important to improve your financial literacy and understand concepts like this. Um, so unfortunately, a number of people are D um, and for those that aren't D, a number of people are C, they're trying to time getting in and out. And really that's what active managers do, active fund managers, um, but they actually, if the active managers can't get it right, how do we as uh, people who are just getting information from the news or Google or maybe a bank website or a Comsec website get that information? So A and B take a more of a longer term approach and that's a, that's a strategy that we employ uh, in assisting our clients. Um, I'll just see how we're going for time. Not too bad, great. Okay, so let's look at um, now the issue at hand, COVID-19. Um, let's put that in perspective and understand where it sits in terms of pandemics. Um, I always say, when we've got uncertainty, it's always important to look at what variables we've got in our decision-making and focus on what is certain. Because too often we focus on the variables and because we can't nail them down, we never make a decision. So let's focus on what is certain. So we know the number of deaths, if we look at pandemics throughout history is on the lower side, not to say they're not significant, but it is on the lower side. Um, and we know throughout history, pandemics have occurred. And we've got two graphs there to show us this. Um, so let's look at what is certain. Well, number one, the lockdown. The lockdown is certain, that's occurring. We don't know whether it'll um, go into a, another stage or not, but we know that the impact of the lockdown is that um, if it's extended, uh, it'll extend the recovery because um, the reason for the lockdown is that so we're not, our medical facilities are not overrun. The problem with having a lockdown is it will take the economy a longer period to recover because it's not just about peak infection. Because as, as if we loosen, if we get to peak infection and the lockdown is loosened and people are allowed to um, mix again, it'll increase the infection rate. So lockdown means businesses close or reduce capacity and it means an increase in unemployment, slowing in demand for goods and services and business investment drops. So it's a bit of a tricky situation having a, a lockdown strategy, which a number of countries are employing because it means the economy economy actually shuts down, um, which can lead to a structural, um, a structural type recession, which, which is essentially a financial or economic recession. At the moment, it's, it's what we call an event-driven um, crisis or correction, um, because it's through a pandemic or a specific event. A structural correction is due to a financial or economic, and these things can be linked. So for those countries that have put their economies in lockdown, uh, it's a slower recovery because they can't afford to reduce the lockdown even though the infection rate plateaus because if we start mixing, uh, the risk of infection goes up and our medical facilities will be overrun. So if you go into lockdown, you're in for the long haul because the only real reason you can uh, open up the um, social distancing lockdown is when we have a vaccination because the key issue here is you don't want medical facilities to be overrun and 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 essentially people dying because they can't get a ventilator or can't get a bed. So we're in, we're in a lockdown. Sweden, on the other hand, they've decided to go the other way. Uh, they've decided to have a very low level of lockdown, if at all, because they're trying to get the infection rate uh, to peak and uh, for as many people to contract it so they can go back and minimize the economic downturn. The problem with that is there's more deaths because clearly the medical facilities can't cope. There, um, I suppose what they would argue, and I'm not arguing either way because a death is significant, um, but their argument is that um, they're comparing financial ruin for people and businesses versus economic ruin. Uh, the pandemic in that case will be over very quickly and people can return to work resuming life in the new normal. The problem is what that doesn't account for is it might have worked in the 1900s, where we didn't travel and there was not as much contact globally, but now it, it's a global issue due to significant travel and international trade. So the question is not what ev every country is doing, but um, 
how long will this pandemic take for a global management strategy? Um, so I don't think the question um, is how long will Australia be in lockdown? It's a case of globally. I don't think um, true returning to normal or the new normal, whatever that is, will be the case until globally we start managing this issue. Um, we just can't continue to close our borders um, and, and think that we're back to the normal. Uh, we are a global society. So statistic modeling, there's so much modeling that's going on. I've been listening to webinars, going to fund manager um, uh, discussions and reports. Statistical modeling, even though the, the slowdown is occurring in Australia, the statistical modeling shows peak infection to be later on this year. But that still doesn't mean an economic recovery because of our lockdown. Um, so I hope you can see that. Um, so each, each market correction um, is unique, but we can see similarities to see how the market responds. So what I've tried to do in making a decision to help us guide our investment strategies, look at what is certain. We know lockdown is certain, we know what that means. We, we're looking at other countries who don't have a lockdown. We know it's a global issue, so we need to recover together. We can't just recover in isolation. It's a global issue. So well, let's look at another certainty and look at history, what's occurred in history. Um, so we know markets are volatile. So let's have a look at the last 40 to 50 years. So every event is unique um, and there's nothing um, that's general about this particular event. It's, a, it's an event driven um, crash uh, because it's a pandemic. And th as I said, there's another type of crash that, which is a structural one that was a GFC. Um, uh, and they're cyclical crashes. They're every number of years due to overvaluation, markets being overvalued. The problem for us um, globally is if that the longer businesses are forced to close, it, the greater chances of our um, economy transitioning to a structural uh, correction driven by economic and financial uh, collapse. So that's the challenge. Um, so we're in a bear market at the moment and it's amazing in the last couple of weeks what's happened. Not amazing, but um, it's frightening, um, but it, it's not new, it's nothing new. So for those of you who are new to a market correction, and that'll be at least 10% because you're under 31, I'm not sure whether you're paying attention what happened in the GFC. Uh, probably in year six or seven. So this is your first bear market. Uh, a bear market is where you've had a price correction in the uh, market index of more than 20%. Okay. Um, and if you look at this chart, uh, we, we had a correction back in 80, uh, in 07 for the GFC. We had another one. Um, yes, yeah, so, so Black Monday, if we go at the, go at the beginning on the left-hand side, Black Monday in October 87, it fell 23%. Um, that was back in 1987. And that was because of short selling and high valuations, very high interest rates as, as well. It took two years to recover from that. So that was what we call a structural crash. Um, then we had the tech bubble, the Y2K, because there was overvaluation of technology stocks. I certainly remember that. Um, and there was no underlying strength in the balance sheet, but people were still um, um, prepared to pay exorbitant amounts. Um, so that's what led to that crash. That was um, very different again. Um, and then we had the GFC, which was another structural crash. That's when junk bonds were disguised as mortgage securities. Uh, so that one took five years to recover um, to the previous high, but the recovery actually started six months after it bottomed out. Okay, so um, it's interesting to look at COVID-19. The, the fall was the fastest ever fall in the Australian market. Um, but the following week was just as dramatic as well. So uh, the following week, um, the market rose by record 7% on the Monday. So there's many variables we have in the current marketplace. There's infection rates, there's massive unprecedented government stimulus. There's an oil price war going on as well. Uh, the good news is there's no credit crunch, so our banks remain strong. Um, so the question is, what do we need? What can we take away from all of this with regards to decision making? Number one, we know what's happened in the past, that markets do recover and this event will pass. The question you need to ask yourself is, what's your financial position and your event, um, your, your life stage investment? 
Where are you at? Are you at accumulation holding or drawdown? Um, and what risk tolerance can you have? And if you're able to answer those three questions, you can develop a strategy for holding or indeed buying, or um, if the case is to change your asset allocation. It's the worst time you change your asset allocation is during a bear market. Um, so let's continue examining this and look at the property market as well. So there's not many indexes that look at the property. So this is one, it's from CoreLogic. Um, it's looking at this here, looking at the uh, orange line, it's clear that property, now this is growth by the way, okay, growth year on year. So that's why the line is going up and down. So if we looked at accumulated, it would be a nice straight line, but you can see growth is generally positive every year, but during, um, during times of crisis, it, it does drop. drop. So it's a little bit all over the place, but generally it does come back. Why there is there a demand for housing? Um, in this case, with the current uh, current crisis, we can see there's a massive amount of government stimulus that's been injected into the economy to keep it running, and our banking sector is in good shape. So the government doesn't want us to have a protracted economic collapse, uh, but still it's uncertain. So. I don't believe it'll be a short-term issue with regard to when the economy will recover because of the lockdown and the impact and the protracted nature of getting out of that. Um, so I always plan for the worst case. I know when I do my retirement modeling with many of you, uh, I always plan for the worst case. And that way, if the worst case occurs, that's what we plan for. And so it's always a case if we, we can expect upside. For example, with returns, when we do our retirement modeling, we anticipate gross returns of 5%. Um, and uh, in, in many, in the majority of cases, we achieve more with long-term returns. So with regards to time frame, I would be expecting and budgeting for 12 to 18 months for us to start developing a vaccine and returning to the new normal. It won't be the old normal because as a result of this challenging time, we'll develop new industries, new ways of working, new ways of productivity, uh, new jobs will be created. So it'll, it'll, it won't be a case of returning to the old normal and moving ahead with GDP based on that, it'll be taking a bit of a tangent with additional uh, productivity, I believe. So as a financial planner, what can I say to you in terms of strategies to navigate this and in fact, write it? Um, well, I have four key areas that I always utilize in all of my investment planning meetings with clients. One is to diversify all the time. Um, the most effective way to do that is by managed funds. So that's one of our invest, investment philosophies. We always diversify. Number two, we always use a principle which I've outlined for you called life stage investing. So we'll invest um, your superannuation and funds under management, whether it's um, a portfolio of managed funds or superannuation or shares based on your life stage. So I will uh, recommend an asset allocation, have a discussion with you, and then it's a case of taking your instructions. Number three, low cost solutions. Um, active management won't always get it right. In the times that they don't get it right, I don't want you being charged high fees. That's one of the reasons we use and promote Vanguard. Um, they are an index manager. They are one of the lowest in the marketplace. And the last one is stick to your investment strategy. For those of you who are our financial planning clients, I've recommended to hold through this current crisis. Why? Because I've allowed for your life stage investment and your asset allocation accordingly. And our retirement modeling has been based on that. So, so it's okay to be concerned because understandably we're looking at this every night on the media and the media drives a lot of fear and panic. But that's where um, my role as a financial planner is to speak to you. Every, every month we carry out annual reviews and we're doing those as we speak. We're doing 20 to 25 annual reviews uh, every month now through Zoom and I'm doing mid year follow-up calls in addition to all the other questions I get. But these are the four principles I have always front of mind when I chat with you. You may not be aware of it and I'll talk to them in different ways, but I'm always talking about diversification, uh, life stage investing, you'll know it our asset allocation, the products we use are low cost and the strategies are designed uh, to be long-term. I remember when I was, um, my dad taught me this when I was very young. He was teaching me to drive. Well, he wasn't teaching me to drive. I was in Darwin and back then in the 70s, not many people uh, drive on the country roads. So I would just sit in his lap and he would say, David, um, 
take the steering wheel. So I'll take the steering wheel and I'd be driving it left to right at 60, 70 kilometers an hour. And I'd have a lot of difficulty keeping it straight. And he told me one thing, and I remember it to this day, and it's a great illustration for today. He said, look at the horizon, don't look only um, 20, 30 meters ahead. So I was looking 20, 30 meters ahead and looking at every twist and turn, and I was trying to manage it. But when I looked at the horizon, it was fantastic. I wasn't actually swerving across the road, nearly causing an accident. My father had a lot of trust in me, more than I had in myself. Um, and it's a similar way with our investment strategies. We need to look long-term and plan. If we make um, short-term decisions where we don't have a strategy, um, it, it will end in tears and failure and, and ruin. So diversified funds, and once they diversified their global, um, global allocation across different uh, countries, um, across different asset classes, across different investment strategies, um, hedged and unhedged, uh, life stage investing, asset allocation, understand that, passive index investing strategy, but at the same time, there's a place for active as well, where balances are higher. And most of all, stick to your strategy, stick to your guns. So let me now get a bit of interaction um, and ask you what your asset allocation is for your superannuation. Now, if you don't have any super, what is it for your property? So let me launch that and I'll give you maybe um, 10 to 15 seconds. So there's no right or wrong answers. Um, so just tick one of them. If you're not sure, just tick that and um, let me know what your thoughts are. Um, and it really is based on what your age is as well. Okay, thank you. I'm not gonna get too much time on that. So let's close that and let me share that with you. So 24% um, said not sure. So that's an action point for you. So in these webinars, um, I'll always help you to write down action points if you're taking notes because often a lot of information is shared and you don't know or don't remember what you need to know or not so that's an action point if you're not sure make sure you find out and if you have a financial planner ask them if you don't certainly uh, give me a call and I'll show you our uh, next steps to engage with us at the end 21% are high growth 24% um, are in growth and look at the ratios they're 70 30 that's what growth is balance is 24 7% are conservative okay so that's a pleasing number. Thank you for your engagement there. Um, and I, I think if you're over 55, it's important to look at your asset allocation, um, including property as well. That would be quite important. So now let's look at um, investing in the marketplace. That's, I think, uh, key in the current time. Um, so this is about being committed. If you're going to invest in the current marketplace, it's about um, having that long-term strategy. I do a lot of ocean kayaking. When I started to learn how to um, kayak, um, I wouldn't actually be prepared for a wave. And um, what happens in a kayak if you get trashed by a wave, for a period of time, you're going sideways on the wave. You're not going down the wave like a surfer. You're actually side on and it's not pretty and you get rolled over up and down. It's not pretty at all. And um, it took me a while to learn how to do what I call broaching preparing for the wave, seeing it come, getting into a position and knowing that when, when the wave comes, you stay in that position. You don't change the position. Unless you're very skilled, um, you can change the position. But in, in the main, you stay in that brooch until the wave passes and then you change. Um, interestingly enough, I have actually learned how to change the position when you're getting broached and trashed in a wave and it's fantastic. But for the main, as long as you can stay broached, you'll survive that wave, you won't get trashed. Similarly, if you're going to be investing in the current time, and now is something to think about, as long as you follow those four key investment principles, a bear market is the perfect time. If you're prepared to invest with courage, um, it's a wonderful time because it's not, it's not every day you get an opportunity where the market is down 20%. So let's look at, um, once again, the life stage investing. If you're in accumulation phase, would you consider this? Yes or no? Put up your hands if you would consider this an accumulation phase, investing in the current marketplace. No trick questions here. Yeah, you'd consider it. I'm not saying do it. I'm saying, yeah, consider it because it's a 20% down. So if you're a number of you have got, um, Daya, certainly you've got one I talked to you this afternoon, Jenna, uh, Jade, um, have got a number of you, younger clients and, and some not so who've got larger amounts of money uh, sitting around. Certainly if you're in, drawdown phase, would you consider investing in the current market situation? 
Mainly no, but if you had a surplus amount of cash that you could afford to um, afford to write out if it went lower, yes, you could as well. So it's a case of getting personal financial advice. There's no general one answer fits all. The key thing um, in, in the main, however, it's a case of making sure that you time it. Now you can't time it. You can't time it because you don't know whether the market's going to fall down further. But you know, as long as you get it in that 20% of the trough, even 30%, you're doing well. And there's a concept called dollar cost averaging. Dollar cost averaging, Google that. I don't have time to talk to you about it now. It's, it's how you get in the market um, and average out the timing of the market. You can't time the market. A lot of people tr um, have tried and, and they failed. People that spend millions of dollars developing software programs. It's, it's extremely difficult based on efficient market hypothesis theory. Um, so dollar cost averaging is a way to get into the market. And that's something that um, if you've got surplus and, and you've got an appropriate time frame and you understand the risk is something to consider. So let's look at the tools that you can use to invest. So let's say you want to invest the market. Uh, you're the investor, you can invest directly in shares, managed funds or residential property. A couple of options there. Um, or you can invest via what we call a wrap account. Um, it's a wrap account is access to a number of different products through one account. Whereas if you go direct, as you had on the first diagram, you've got um, individual accounts with ev uh, for each of these particular asset classes. So that's what a wrap account is. Um, now with a wrap account, um, you've got many investors where the funds are aggregated. So you along with thousands of other investors are investing in the various investment products. So the main difference between wrap accounts and individual investing is one retail versus wholesale pricing. Okay, so with regard to um, retail, if you're going direct, it'll be a higher cost, whereas through a wrap, it'll be a lower cost. The other significant difference is the minimum entry level requirements. If you're going directly, um, particularly to manage funds, and the reason I prefer manage funds is because of the diversification that you don't get by direct investing in shares. Uh, but with managed funds, often um, there's significant um, hurdles with regard to minimum amounts, often half a million dollars to get into the fund going direct. Whereas if you're going through a wrap platform, it's low as $5,000. Um, rebalancing the asset allocation, that's that's the key term I'll use throughout the presentation. If you've got a wrap account, it's easy to rebalance because you can do it at an account level. Whereas if you're directly investing, you need to, you need to sell and reinvest uh, with the money coming back to you and then going back. Uh, reporting is uh, a lot easier with a wrap platform and diversification, which is key, is, is better and easier through a wrap platform as well. So we advocate using wrap accounts. Uh, for these reasons, if you're maybe got a, a surplus amount of money that's that uh, maybe you're looking to save money for a deposit and cost to buy a property, better to have it um, engaged in a wrap account with the appropriate asset, alloca asset allocation, of course. So bear that in mind um, rather than having it sitting in cash, because in cash, how much are you getting? 1.5, maybe 1.9 if you've got 100K. Uh, so it's a, it's a case of making sure when we do our reviews for you, when we do our initial meetings, it's about making sure each of your assets are deployed effectively. Now let's have a look at returns. Okay, so what's happened? We've been smashed in the marketplace. So let's look at returns as at the end of March. And I showed you this slide um, last time I did the presentation. So um, you can go back to the last presentation and see this. Um, and I've got a comparison to follow as well. So you can see the returns for high growth. Remember, remember the asset allocation for high growth? It's 90-10, as it says here on this slide. Where it's conservative, that's in green, two from the bottom, it's 30-70. So you can see the 10-year returns reduce as you um, go from predominantly growth to predominantly defensive because it's less risk. Risk and return are um, a relationship that you can't ignore. If someone says, I can give you the great return, David, for low risk, something doesn't add up, okay? So um, if you look at the last year, the last 12 months to the end of March, we've been smashed. Minus 6.15 in high growth, understandably, because that's 90% in shares. So if you had a look at these numbers, as at the end of March, you think, damn, do I really wanna go in this investment? 
10 year returns look okay, but the one year is really not the best. However, if you looked at these returns uh, as at the end of December, they were very different. So the 12 month returns as at the end of December for high growth were 23.5. This is where the volatility is. So you can see that um, the one year returns um, from month to month change based on what's happening in the marketplace. So there's a significant difference uh, if you looked at them two or three months ago even. Um, so once again, it's about setting the right, um, the setting the right uh, investment life stage and the asset allocation and making sure you've got enough time frame. Uh, I spoke to Dare this afternoon. He's got 120. He's 49, if I have you correct there. Um, and yeah, certainly got a surplus lump sum from a bonus looking to invest it. Um, and he's looking to go growth or high growth. Um, and the reason the one year returns to the end of March don't concern him is because of his time frame. The money that he's going to invest is going to be invested for in the vicinity of 10 years. So he's looking at long term returns. So the action point for you in this case, if you've got surplus funds, you've got to ask yourself, do I put it in my mortgage? Do I pay off an investment loan? Or do I invest it in super or do I put it in a fund? You've got to have a plan for your funding. What's going to give you the most return? That's the role of a financial planner is to give you the options. Leaving the cash is not an option. That may mean getting a little bit of discomfort, but I think that's healthy along with knowledge. Uh, so it's important to make sure each of your assets are deployed effectively. Okay, we're on the home stretch. So we're talking about uh, investing with courage. So one is to actually look at um, buying into the market and, and diversifying accordingly. Um, using low cost structures, using an appropriate investment life stage and, and low cost as well. The other one is investing in property. So I'm going to skip through this quickly. This is just a, a summary because I did cover this in the previous slide. So when you're investing in property, um, and why is it a good time to invest in property? Well, the market will slow. I don't believe there'll be a, a significant correction in the marketplace because it's not an economic or financial collapse. It's more event driven, health driven. So the underlying foundations are still there, but there'll be an opportunity uh, for some pricing concessions, let's say. So it's important to understand how much you can purchase um, and how much deposit and cost. So if you're looking to start off and getting into property, you've got to understand, have I got enough money? Well, if you have a 70% loan, you need to pay 35% of the purchase price roughly for the deposit and costs. If you're getting an 80% loan, you'll need to allow for about 25 and a 90% loan, you need to allow 17% for the depositing cost, typically associated with a purchase. So if you had a purchase of 750 uh, and you had a 70% loan, you need to have between 260, 2500 and 175 if it was a 500K property. Let's quickly go to the last one. If you're going for a 90% loan, that same property for 750, if you've got a 90% loan, you'd only need 127 and a half. Whereas if you've got a 500K property, you only need 85K. So an action point here is if you're looking to buy a property, whether or not you're there yet, you need to find out what's your maximum loan amount, what's your borrowing capacity. And certainly we can help you with that as well. Now, the other one is understanding cash flow. So the first previous slide was about how much money do I need? The other question that we can help with as a financial planner is how much is it going to cost me? So our role is to make good, help you make good financial decisions. And the way I do that is to make decisions very crystal clear. And I do them on the whiteboard in our office. So I, I do them live or unplugged as I like to call them so that there's no black box of putting it into a, a program to work it out. So you can understand how we do that. So let's look at this property. It's the same one I used in the previous uh, webinar, somewhat six, eight weeks ago. It's a property for 568 in Parramatta, two bedroom, two bathroom, the ideal first place. Whether it's an ideal investment, I'll leave it up to you. Uh, so the action point is formulate a buying strategy. What can you afford? Well, the question is, I don't know, what's it gonna cost me, David? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you what it will cost you. So rental income, what's it gonna generate in rental income if you buy it as an investment property? Well, at 550, it's 28,600. If you buy it as a home, zero. Then I've got all the costs there. I'm not going to go through all of them. Other than line six, the total costs are 33,800 and 43,820 if you have a home. And so the pre-tax costs are 5,200 if you have it as an investment and 43,820 if you have it as a home. Now, if we allow for tax benefits, 
the after-tax cost is uh, is there in blue, line item number nine. So line item number 11 and 12 is the total cost of that strategy. So if you look at line item number 12, um, if you buy it as an investment property, sorry, line item number 10 is really important because if you buy it as an investment, you still need to find somewhere to live. So let's just compare apples to apples, assuming that um, it's a, you're renting at the same price, 550. Um, so the total cost of buying it as an investment property and still paying for somewhere to rent yourself is 2687 per annum. Oh, sorry, per month, 2687. If you bought that property in Parramatta as a home, it would cost you 3652. And the funds required line item 13 to actually settle. How much money do you need? Well, if you bought it as an investment, you need 82, 85, 200. And as a home, it would be 51 and a half, including the first time home concessions, okay? So um, it's really important. They should make it crystal clear in terms of what strategy. So my role is to guide you so you know what you're aiming for. If you don't have a goal, you'll hit it very You'll hit it, but certainly um, it could take some time because you won't know what to aim for and what your target is. Okay, goodness, I need to take a breather, have a drink. Okay, now let's um, go through some questions. How are we going with time? Goodness, we're running okay, fantastic. So send in your questions now. I'll go to the um, webcam and I'll just go through some of the questions. So um, just type in your questions now. I know a number of people have um, popped them through. Uh, Rightio, so Robin uh, from the Oak said, are our investments safe and secure? Robin, you're a long-term financial planning client of ours. Um, the investments that we choose are rated and monitored every month. Um, so nothing is guaranteed um, unless you've got money in the bank. However, um, I'll call you um, and let you know the rationale for the decision uh, that we, the decisions that we've made with regard to your investments. They're very similar to all of our other investment strategies. And you've come to our Christmas party. Um, I look forward to having you there again, along with many of the people here this evening. Um, you'll notice the investment strategies and products that we use are very similar for a good reason. So have a chat to everyone else at the table at the Christmas party this year, and, and um, you'll, you'll understand why we've chosen the strategies we have for you on the products. Uh, Jenny, and I'm just going through the ones um, that people have submitted first and just mindful of time. Jenny from Darwin has said, how do I slow the decline in my super through the investments? How can I go to a low conservative risk away from the more aggressive? I would say, Jenny, um, you need to understand the cost of doing that and need to understand what asset allocation you are now to which one you're going to go to. So if you are in high growth, for example, and you want to go to the least aggressive, which is conservative or capital stable, that's a massive loss that you'll take. And, and it's a loss that you'll crystallize. If you don't do that, you'll have what you call an unrealized loss, which means it's not actually recorded on paper. You don't actually um, feel it in, in your balance because you're not actually cashing it in. It's like the property market going up and down. Unless you sell the property, the movements up and down are unrealized or real, un unrealized losses or gains. It's only when you sell it that you actually get the money in the bank and feel the impact of the less loss or the gain. It's the same with um, market movements within your super and your funds under management. So I think that discussion um, comes down to number one, um, what you are in the, what you are in, and number two, what you want to go, and seeing what your asset allocation strategy is. Um, so more discussion required there. Ken said, any tips for people on the cusp of transition to retirement who have both a super and a property portfolio? I've had a discussion with two people today about that. Uh, you're our, our Dalvin clients. I'm revisiting the retirement modeling uh, because that is a very, very, very conservative, almost to the point of a pessimistic scenario. And I, I'm redoing that for you. So uh, Ken, it's a case of revisiting the modeling to see if the assumptions are still correct. Tiho, all the way from New Zealand, I hope you and Ileana are well. Um, the stability and prognosis of the shares investment with the Macquarie Vanguard in the current global situation. I will be calling you with regard to your specific questions, um, but um, depends once you get on the asset allocation that you have. Um, so I'll talk to you specifically about yours. Well, obviously the higher the asset allocation, the more the impact. The lower the asset allocation, the less the impact because we've got more exposure to defensive assets. 
So we'll call you and go through that. As to whether it's an impact for you, it depends on when you're looking to cash them in, okay, when you realize that. Um, nice question from Emojin, a friend of Ben, personal trainer of my wife. Um, and I'm still sore, Ben, thank you very much. Or not. Uh, would you, and Emojin says, would you consider taking out a margin loan? I like that question. And with all the products I advocate and recommend, I, I've tried out 95% of them. Okay, so I've, between myself and my wife, we've got five investment properties, we've got a self-managed super fund, we've got a, um, investing in the market in managed funds. And in the GFC, post GFC, I actually did what you're suggesting. I took out a margin loan and I held myself accountable and thought, if I was going to recommend it as an investment, I'd take it out for a reasonable amount, not, not just 10, 20, 30. So I took it out for 400,000 and I got a loan for 400,000. Okay, so um, would I recommend it now? It's something really to think through because firstly, it's hard to get a margin loan. Uh, we looked at that just today. I was able to take out a 100% facility, so there was no money down. Um, and the cost of it was quite high. So you need to determine what your break even is. The great thing about a margin or a um, equity type loan for, is zero money. You can get it for 100%. So as long as, as, long as you can fund the negative cash flow, um, you, it's a case of writing it out. But it is a higher risk strategy. So um, certainly something to consider. Would I do it again? No, because I think there's easier ways, but you may be younger and uh, you may be able to. Mike from Mount Riverview, I hope you're well there, Mike. Um, retirement tips, certainly retirement modeling. There's no, uh, with regard to Ken's question as well, with retirement, I, I suggest getting absolute certainty, no tips. And certainly um, the modeling that we offer um, makes everything crystal clear. So um, Peter from Canberra, global recession, question mark. I'm, I'm not really sure, Peter. I'm a mild mounted financial planner, accountant and mortgage broker. Um, I think there's better qualified people to have a look at that. Um, but I tend to focus on what I can be certain of, and that's that their lockdown will produce a recovery that's a little bit slower. Um, and what I can do is I'm looking at my asset allocation. I'm looking at personally investing in the market as well. That's just me, I'm not saying you do it, but look at your risk profile, look at your investing life stage and make appropriate decisions. And if your investment is just super that you're looking at, if you've got an appropriate time frame for retirement, it's an unrealized loss for you. It has a minimal impact. And if you believe the market's going to increase in value, why would you be looking at doing anything, even if there was a global recession? Jerry from Minto, hope you're well. Carolyn as well. Uh, world economy versus Australian economy. I think I've covered that just in the previous answer in terms of looking at the Australian economy. Unfortunately, the Australian economy is only less or less than 3% of the global. Uh, so that's why I believe in diversifying across globally. Your investments are invested globally. Okay, so that's very key. As to what that means from a recessionary or contraction point of view, I can't comment. I know just what the Australian impact is and I'm preparing accordingly, as you should as well. Um, Stephen from Manly, should I be changing my super into conservative? Very similar to the first question we had from Jenny. Depends what you're in currently and what's the loss and are you prepared to realize it and can you afford to re realize it or can you afford to write it out? Matt from Sydney, Matt and Lily, how to defer the loan repayments to secure the best rates? Two separate questions. Each of the lenders um, on their websites have got forms where you enter all your information and the interest is capitalized for up to six months and then at the end of the six months, the loan repayments are renegotiated for the remainder of the term. As far as the rates, rates are absolutely fantastic at the moment. Our mortgage division is very, very busy. Um, extending interest only terms, which is key as you get older, as well as uh, refinancing to take advantage. Uh, Jade from Toongabi, realized and unrealized losses have done that. Dave from Lane Cove, show me the money. I was waiting for someone to ask me that question. Um, now, just, just uh, I, I think I'll close there with the questions. Um, just to let my clients know, if you're over 55, I will be calling you, but don't hesitate to give me a call um, and book in a time. Some resources, I always like to give you some tips for what to do, um, and I'll just shut down the web, uh, no other cam. Uh, the Red Book is a fantastic book. It's from Jack Bogle, um, the person who commenced Vanguard. Um, it started off as a mutual fund, 
and then went to an index fund. It's called Common Sense Investing. It's one of the most interesting books I've read on investing. Um, a lot of online learning you can have a look at and you know get on top of your finances via Zoom. You may wish to engage with your financial planner or ourselves. Um, so you're welcome to do that as well. Um, lastly, how do you engage with us? Well, there's a couple of different ways. Number one, you can have a phone call with us. I'm happy to have a free 15 minute chat with you for any general advice. Um, if you wish to engage with us professionally, our initial meeting covers off pretty well everything which is in your fact find. Uh, there's a fee for that. It's 660 uh, for non-retirement planning. And if it's retirement planning related, being you're over 55, it's 975. That's on a fee for service. And the reason there's a fee is I make sure I understand your finances and all of the options before the meeting. We have up to two meetings to look at all the options or where you're headed, uh, whether you like that or not, and options. And then at the end of that, uh, if you decide to become a client, that initial fee is waived uh, in lieu of the implementation ongoing service fees that we have for clients. Or you can choose not to proceed. And then the initial meeting fee is charged. Um, it is a form of cost recovery for us. And we usually allow 30 days for you to have a think about that. So that's how to engage with us. And at the end of the webinar, you can simply say, um, if you'd like us to contact you, yes or no, and I'll be able to do that. Webinar dates are for the next couple of ones. We've got a retirement webinar. So for those of you, um, I think there was about 30%, 37% who were over 55. If you don't have a retirement plan and property investors, it's hard to find um, retirement planning for you guys because most financial planners will simply say sell, put it, into, put it into super. For us, it's a case of going through the options with you. 4th of June, uh, 2020 and then retirement planning for property investors uh, that's specifically for property investors that's in August as well so hope you enjoyed listening to the webinar this evening I certainly enjoyed having your company I'm sorry I couldn't answer more questions but if uh, you'd like to contact me I'm happy to have a chat with you as I said we will be uploading this webinar in the next 24 hours to our Facebook page and to our YouTube channel, Davil and Finance page, I'm in the process of updating that to Davil and Wealth Management. There's a lot of older recordings there um, and the content remains relevant because it's strategy based. Uh, so have a look there if you're wanting to get more content, but thank you very much for your company. Please don't forget to complete the exit survey. Um, see you on Zoom or at our next webinar. Until then, stay safe. Thank you for now, bye.